so, um, so during this uh, hour and a half, maybe a little bit less if I keep going too fast, um, I'd like to talk about the optimization issues in, in neural networks and show that this is a very strange world indeed. Uh, so I'm going to start with some optimization basics and become increasingly more specific. So the first thing is that uh, optimization in the literature, 90%, and it's probably growing, is about convex optimization. And convex optimization is mathematically nice because uh, any local minimum is a global minimum. Whenever you run your optimization again and again and again, it always returns the same result. And you can know mathematically precisely what the result should be. Uh, and here we're in this non-convex world. So the landscape is a complicated thing, like, uh, and, and you'll see later that this is a simplification. It's much worse than that. As local minima, saddle points, plateau, ravines, and there is a, a topological issue. You know, we, we discuss the landscape like we would have discussed the landscape outside. You, know, you have uh, uh, ravines, gorges, and, and you have to go down there. And the uh, optimization algorithms are typically uh, finding local minima. In fact, I know only one way to compute a global minimum in the neural network, and that's only for one hidden layer on neural networks, and it's very slow. And then the question is whether the local minima are good or bad, because there are plenty, they can be different. And the results you obtain depend on subtle details, and because you're going to initialize your ways randomly, they're not always replicable. Uh, surprisingly, it works quite well, and that's a good question. Uh, why is a good question? And uh, the truth is that in learning, a lot of problems are non-convex in nature. You have the multilayer networks, but pretty much every clustering algorithm involves a non-convex part. If you want to learn features, well, there are cases that are convex, but the, the real generic ones are non-convex. If you have mixture models, or so pretty much all the Soyuz Bayesian stuff is non-convex. Hidden Markov models are non-convex. Um, a large number of the feature selection algorithms are non-convex. And in fact, if you think about it, when humans compute features, you, know, you have the model where you have a linear system with a convex loss, or, or even a support vector machine. In fact, and humans come and invent smart features. It's just like learning features. You have a human in the loop, and if you look at the global thing, including the human, it's non-convex. So, uh, so I think it's something we cannot really escape in machine learning, at least uh, uh, when you look at real problems. And uh, this is a mathematically thorny issue. Um, so what I'm going to do now is go over some uh, uh, simple optimization ideas. And I, I keep them simple because even though there are very sophisticated things in optimization, when you come to these neural networks and have to make them work, after checking that the gradients are computed correctly, of course, and I insist on that, <laughs> uh, uh, you really want to use simple uh, hints of what's going on and why it's working, why it's not working. And there are plenty of things you can see. You just have to, to use a lot of common sense that's uh, uh, helped by uh, some sound uh, mathematical uh, and simple mathematical insights. So first, there is optimization with derivatives. And the derivative indicates the general position of the closest local minimum. If you have a second derivative, you can say, well, I have a kind of local uh, quadratic ball, and that gives an idea of where it is. It doesn't always exist. The derivatives can be difficult to compute. There are many problems where you don't have them. So this is why we always try to smooth things in neural nets to have derivatives, because uh, um, to, to draw a parallel in the convex world, you can do quite a lot of non-smooth optimization with uh, some hinge loss or, or some strange things, because the convexity itself has properties that are quite good. If you're non-convex and non-smooth, you're in a difficult domain. Well, you can have some angles once in a while, but it's not always that easy. Then I'm going to speak about line search. Suppose you're in a big landscape like this, and somebody gives you a direction, and you want to find a local minimum in that direction. And this is a primitive that's going to be used in many places. So the first thing you have to understand is that you want to find the minimum in a very secure way, so you want to be sure that between two points there is a minimum. And uh, you know when you do something like finding a zero of a function in the real world, 
in the real, uh, in the real line. You know, sorry, the real world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you do it by bracketing the zero, so you find two points, where when the function is positive, where the function is negative, and because you know the function is continuous, there should be a zero in between, and you keep reducing the bracket. Now, if you want to bracket the minimum, you need three points. You need one point in the middle where the function is less than the points around it. So how you find these first three points? Well, you have to search uh, brutally, but then you find this. And then you take an extra point, and you're going to put it in the biggest segment. When you put it in the biggest segment, uh, now you have a set of three points here that bracket the minimum more specifically. And you can go on, you're going to put an extra point here, and now you can take these three, and go on, an extra point here, you take these three, and go on, and that way you find the minimum. Now, if you look a little bit more closely, you might wonder why it's best to place the point. And uh, a little bit of math shows that it's good to have the, the golden ratio, so you, 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 you don't want to put it in the middle, because if you put it in the middle, you have two possibilities. The first possibility is that the three points are going to be these ones, and the other possibility is the three points are going these ones. So in the second possibility, if you place in the middle, you divide the interval by two, but in the first possibility, you would only have this one plus this half, so you, you would not divide as effectively. So the way to be sure to have a good ratio all the time is to use this uneven split. And well, it's just a little bit of uh, analysis to see that. And this is why this is called the golden ratio algorithm. Now you can do something more subtle. You can say, I have three points, I can fit a parabola. And if you fit a parabola and take the minimum of the parabola, you're going to find a very often, a much better guess of where the minimum is. Very often, but not always. Like if you have something like this, which is quite common, and you take your parabola, you're completely off. Well, if you had split this interval, you would be better. So people thought very hard about this problem, and they came up with a solution that's brutal in its simplicity. It's the Brent algorithm which is to alternate the golden search and the parabolic interpolation. You do one and the other, one and the other, one and the other. And the, the good property of this is that you cannot be more than twice slower than the best one. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's true. <laughs> and uh, this is pretty much uh, the best thing you can do in line search. And of course, if you know the derivatives, like uh, to give you an example, uh, let me go back. Uh, if you know, for instance, the derivative in that point and the derivative in that point, maybe you can make a nice search to find the intersection and everything, but it's not much more of a gain in comparison to just using the functions. But yeah, you can small improvements by knowing the derivatives. So this is just to show that sometimes something very simple and common sense works. Yes? Um, with the parabolic line thing, um, Well, you want to find one. You want to find one local minimum, and you know that these three points bracket the minimum, meaning that this one has a value that's lower than these two. So you guarantee that the parabola is going to be like this, and therefore there's going to be a minimum of the parabola. OK? Well, simple little algorithm, but it has the benefit of being very simple and effective. So now, Let's look at uh, our little neurons again and look at something that could be surprising. So here I have a linear transform. I have some x vector here, or column vector, a matrix. I get a column vector of activations, and I go to some nonlinear function, uh, component-wise, I get my output. And uh, you have the rules of propagation and the back propagation, which is uh, derivative with respect to a is the derivative with respect to y multiplied by f prime of a, and the derivative with respect to x is the derivative with respect to a multiplied by w on the left side because these are row vectors, and so on. So what I'm going to do is just a small change. I'm going to divide the weights by 2, so I say w nu is w divided by 2, and to compensate, I'm going to make the function twice, twice steeper. So when I'm doing this, I'm changing nothing in the propagation. So now you have to think a little bit. 
what is doing about the derivative here? Any idea? Or oh, you can take 30 seconds. <laughs> Somebody tells me what's happening with the derivative when you do this. Hmm? By how much? Shallower by two. I don't know. Look, GY is the same. F, F is doubled. So GA is twice as big. And if GA is twice as big, but GX is twice as big, and delta W is going to be twice as big. At the same time, the weights were twice slower. So, sorry, twice smaller. So the ratio is now four. Isn't that strange? So I do it again. I, <laughs> I divide the weights by two, and I correct by making the function twice steeper. And so this group of things computes exactly the same thing in forward propagation. <laughs> F, uh, let's say it's, a, let's say it's a, a hyperbolic tangent. I change it to two twice the hyperbolic tangent. So basically, if W is twice smaller, A is twice smaller, but because of the two, I'm just applying exactly the same thing. Uh, so, oh, sorry, it's not 2f, it's f of 2. Ah, sorry. Ah. Yeah. I've choked somewhere here, I had prepared it, but I lost it. Ah, you took it. Sorry, so, 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 so you replace f of a by f of 2a, which is a change um, of the things, yeah. So, yes, I, I'm wrong. I, uh, but it doesn't change the derivative. Basically, you have x, a is twice slower, and f of 2a is the same thing. So if you take the derivative, assuming everything else is the same, you have the same gy here, you multiply by the f prime of 2a, which is going, uh, there is a 2 because when you're going to do the, the chain rule, they're going to, the 2 is going to show up. So ga is twice larger, and therefore, the derivative respect to the weights is twice larger, even though the weights were divided by two. So if you put back in the initial scale, it's just like having increased the derivatives four times with respect to the same weights. OK, let's keep that in mind. There is something fishy there. So let's try optimization very simple. Simple gradient descent. Let's take a parabola, this beast here. So I hope um, I did everything right this time. So my cost is c over 2 w square, and this is my gradient descent rule. So the question is, how does the eta affect the convergence? And what's the best value of eta? So how long do you need to do that? <laughs> it's not too difficult. <laughs> it's true, you don't have a paper. I should have said you should come with a pen and paper. So any idea, how do I start? <laughs> now, it's interesting because it's good to know these things. <laughs> you, know, the, uh, you, can, you can see the last NIPS paper about something very complicated, like accelerated gradient, whatever, and everything, but yeah, you just look at it. So we should start right the gradient descent. Huh? So I say WT plus 1 equal WT minus eta, eta what? <laughs> Uh-huh, C, W, T, equal 1 minus eta C, W, T. So it's quite easy now to see what's happening. It all depends on the value of this number. If its, it's absolute value is less than 1, I'm going to converge. In fact, if I set eta to be 1 over c, it happens to be 0. So in one step, I'll go there. That's the optimal value of eta. Now, if this value is positive, so let's see. If this value is less than 1, so let's, look at, let's, let's call this s. And here is the line. You have minus 1, plus 1, 0. So if I'm here, 
I'm going to start from here, and I'm going to make a, a jump that way. That's going to take me. Uh, basically, I'm going to go past where I was, and I'm going to go here, and up, and up. I'm diverging. If it's between zero and one, well, this time I'm going down like this, exponentially. If it's between minus one and zero, well, I'm going down, but like this. Okay? And if it's negative and greater than one, I'm again diverging this way. Okay, so we know pretty much that if I take the curvature, and uh, basically I want my learning rate to be relative to the inverse of the curvature in some reasonable way. It should be related to the inverse of the curvature. If it's the inverse of the curvature exactly, I'm perfectly fine. Otherwise, it should be less than 2 over the curvature, so that I'm made more than minus 1. And small is good as well. So, I'll write it here just to remember. Eta equal 1 over C, it's perfect. Eta less than 2 over C, it converges. So, if it's two over C, between 1 over C and 2 over C, it converges in zigzag. Below 1 over C, it converges in line. Okay, good. That's one dimension. Now let's take two dimensions. And I'm going to say have two different curvatures. So in this direction, the curvature is very high. In this direction, the curvature is very slow. So what my best eta now? So what's happening? Oh, tell, tell me something. <laughs> Yes. So the high curvature constrains how big I can have eta. And the low curvature constrains how quickly I'm converging. So when I have a big ratio of curvature like this, I'm not in a very good shape. Does it make sense? Because I must have a curvature that's less than one than two over the high curvature. So it has to be small. My eta has to be smaller than 2 over the high curvature, otherwise I'm going to diverge in the high curvature direction. And then my eta is a bit too small to be good in the low curvature. I'm just going to go quite slowly, still exponentially, but quite slowly. Well, I can do that uh, oblique as well. So it's the same thing, basically, because uh, this time you have uh, the cost is WHW, so if I write it this way, I can replace C by H, C by H, and now I just have to see what's the, this is identity, sorry. And now I have to see what's the eigen spectrum of this. So depending on the eigen values of H, I'm going to have a high eta, small eta, and of course the biggest eta you can have is 2 over the largest eigen value, and the slowest eigen value is going to decide how quickly you're going to converge. Except that there is a little thing you have to be careful, because when you converge, you have to see whether you converge in the W space or in the E space. If I to converge in the W space, a low eigenvalue is going to slow me down, because, well, I have this long, flat thing, my learning rate is limited by the high eigenvalue, so I'm doing things like this. It's very small, very slow. But what's happening at the same time is that, in terms of the value E, this doesn't matter that much, because it's quite uh, small. So, if you want to estimate the value of E, you're going to have something like E of WT plus 1 is going to be, well, one half of uh, uh, I minus eta H, you have a H, I minus eta h, there are probably some transpose, and uh, uh, wt, and then you can try to play a game to see how it goes, and all this has the same eigenvectors, so you can look at the eigenvalues and see what it does. So it's not as bad as it could be, but still. Okay. Now we're going to do the same thing that we did with our network. 
We're going to scale things. So we're going to replace W by a W, which is going to be the one half power of the Hessian. So the Hessian is a symmetric positive matrix. So the, the one half means that you take all the eigenvalues and take the square root. And so E becomes a one half of W transpose nu, double nu. So now it's perfectly circular. So if we do this and we write the gradient descent in this space, in the double nu space, what do you get? I know it's very elementary, but, but uh, it's good to see it. Because at the beginning, remember this story of the little neural network where we rescale things, and things appear very bizarre. But it's not a property of the neural networks, it's a property of the gradient descent. Because here I'm doing a rescaling, I'm changing the weight space. I'm changing the function so it's exactly the same thing. I write the gradient, and uh, in the double new space, is going to be simply w nu t plus 1 equal w nu t minus eta w nu uh, t. Yeah, okay. T equal 1 minus eta w nu t. It's quite easy to see that eta should be 1, that it's more than 2, it's going to diverge. If it's less than 2, it's going to converge and everything is fine, and you don't have the problem of having two different curvatures to deal with. Now, if you compare this with the gradient in W, we had WT plus 1 equal WT minus eta HWT, which I can rewrite like this, identity. That was the original one. Now, see what this does if I try to express this in terms of WT. So this is h one half w t plus one equal h one half w t minus eta h one half h one half w t nu. Did I forget something? W t. No, it's not like this, just one. There's something wrong. It's not it, I know it's not it. <laughs> hmm? Okay, I'm going to, what is H in the first equation? In this one? Uh, I just writing the gradient in the W space. The so gradient of E with respect to W nu is W nu. There is no H there in that one. What's the first equation? The first equation? Yes. Uh, so W nu is what, H one half W. Uh, yes, it's supposed to be H minus one half W. That's the problem. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, I have to redo my slides. I'll fix them. I'll just, when I give the slides to Philippe, I'll fix everything. So it's a minus. So when I replace down, uh, W means that basically the, the thing is WT equal H1 half W nu. So, hmm. No, no, that's correct. That's correct. Start again. So, uh, so W is equal H, my, H minus one half W nu. So I'm going just to replace it. I'm going to say this is HRC minus one half W. Uh, There's something very fishy here. H. W nu equal one half 
well, okay, I'm going to write WT plus 1 equal H minus, minus 1 half of W nu T plus 1 equal H minus 1 half of W nu, sorry, <coughs> nu T minus, there is a minus here, eta H minus 1 half W nu T. You know what? I'm very tired. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Equal, therefore, well, it's, it's actually trivial. Wt <laughs> nu minus eta Wt nu, but I want to write it with the derivative. So this, I remember that derivative of e with respect of w, not new anymore. Uh, equals uh, Hwt. So to get Wt here, this is equal to Wt minus eta H minus 1 of derivative of E respect to W. Okay, forgot it. Sorry, I just messed up. Um, so what I see is that if I compare the normal gradient, which is Wt equal plus 1 equal Wt minus eta derivative of E with respect to W. So that's the normal gradient. And this is what's happening when I'm doing the rescaling. So I multiply the gradient by the inverse of the curvature. That's a Newton algorithm, in fact. So what you see here is that all this gradient descent is not invariant when you rescale the space. And the best way to rescale the space is to do it with this uh, uh, half Hessian because you make everything round and the gradient descent goes fast. And that's the basis of a lot of advanced optimization algorithms, in fact. Now I'm slower than I want to be. <laughs> So, oh, <laughs> I forgot that I had that slide. <laughs> okay, practical issues. The objective function is not quadratic. Here I just assume the quadratic ball. And the local quadratic approximation is reasonable. Locally, you're going, you can say if it's smooth and differentiable and everything, you can say have a parabola that's close. But the Hessian is going to change depending where you are. So you cannot assume you know the Hessian in advance. You have to estimate it where you go. Also, when the objective is non-convex, the Hessian can have negative eigenvalues. So if you do something like Newton, you're not going to go to a minimum. You're going to go to a maximum. It's going to find the, the, the singular point of the parabola. And if the parabola is backwards, it's going to be up. So you have to estimate the Hessian on the fly. And also, in the case of a neural net, well, uh, the dimension of the weight vector is, can be millions, billions. The Hessian is too large to store or invert. So too large to invert and sometimes to store. But there are a lot of standard solutions. And there are plenty of ideas that have been uh, developed in the literature. The first one is to estimate the compact approximation of H minus 1 directly. So you could say H minus 1, let's say, is a diagonal plus a low rank matrix. And the way you do it is that you record the gradients while you go. And of course, you, you have these kinds of equations that are just appear. Like, for instance, g of wt minus g of wt minus 1 should be approximately equal to the Asian in wt times wt minus wt minus 1. 
So while you go, you can record this difference and this difference, and you accumulate a lot of information about the gradients, and there are smart ways to actually try to update a low-rank estimate of the Hessian. Uh, there is an example that's interesting, which is to use line search, because uh, line search is something that gives you an interesting property. If I have a direction, and I find the minimum in my direction, so I'm at the minimum, I know that here, the gradient is orthogonal to my direction. Because if the gradient was like this, I could go a little bit more. If the gradient was like this, I could go back a little more. So it's orthogonal that way, but it's orthogonal in the non rescale space. So what I would like instead is to be orthogonal in the edge rescale space. And that's the notion of conjugate directions. You say that two directions are conjugate if d, uh, let's say dt and dt minus 1 are conjugate, if dt transpose h dt minus 1 is 0, meaning that you're orthogonal in the edge rescale space. So what you want to do is uh, suppose that you have dt minus 1, t minus 2, t minus k, which are the last search direction. So you reach a minimum in your line search, the gradient is like this. And you know you don't want to go in the direction of the gradient because even though it's orthogonal to my direction in the current space, it's not orthogonal in the search space. So I want to change the direction a little bit by doing something like this, for instance, a linear combination of the gradient and past directions, such that this is true. Now, how do you estimate this? Well, there is something interesting, h dt minus i. You know that at step minus i, you did something like wt minus i plus 1 equals some scalar times the direction t minus i. So if you multiply by the Hessian, this is the same as gt minus i plus 1 minus gt minus i, if the Hessian is locally constant. It's the same relation as this. And this equals mu h dt minus i. So my relation, which was d transpose t h dt minus i equals 0, is the same thing as saying that d transpose t h g t minus i plus 1 minus g t minus i equal 0 without the h. Because this quantity is proportional to h dt minus i, which is this I'm looking for. And I have all these quantities. I can record in the past the differences of gradients I observe and the directions I follow. And when you do this like this with one direction, you get the conjugate gradient algorithm. And if you do it with k directions, you can get, actually, it's a variant of LBFVH that's quite popular, but there are, there are also LBFGS that use the first approach. So, so there are a number of these things. So when you do something like this, this is equivalent to going forward and estimating at the same time uh, a low uh, compact approximation of the inverse of the Hessian, and at least you're correcting for the biggest eigenvalues, if not correcting for all of them. So you, you, you're getting the biggest offenders in terms of uh, slowing down. Now, is this the solution? And then you have to be very careful. There are three reasons to remain very suspicious. First, our cost function is the sum of a large number of terms. You have one billion examples, you have one billion terms. It's a very specific form, it's very special, and there should be ways to use this. The second is that we have a learning problem. So a random subset of these terms is already a good indicator of what's going on. So, so instead of using all the terms, I could use a subset of the terms. And at least at the beginning, it would give me, get me in the right ballpark. And the reason why this is true is because if that was not true, we couldn't expect our model to generalize. Suppose that you start optimizing on half the examples. Well, you should be in the ballpark. Otherwise, uh, you, your model is overfitting like crazy and you're not going to get anything good anyway. The third thing is that Quickly achieving a good test set performance, which is what we want to do, is not the same as quickly achieving a good training set performance, for exactly that reason. 
meaning that uh, if you're in a situation where you have quite a lot of difference between what you can do on half the examples or the full set of examples, it means that you are already overfitting. Uh, okay, you could overfit very quickly, but that wouldn't help you. So you have to be careful with this, and that's going to justify a lot of the things we actually do. There are simple things we can do, though. The first one is preconditioning the inputs. Like, if you get all the inputs in the same range, you know, same kind of statistics, same kind of means, same kind of standard deviations, you're going to minimize the fact that, that having balls that are just uh, very skewed, you're going to have less. Uh, you can use different steps in different layers, because you know that if you have a neural net that has a very dense layer with a lot of weights and everything, and then a very small one, it's pretty clear that the curvatures will be different, and we're going to discuss that later. Uh, what you can do is you can look at your network, look at the average size of the gradients in a layer, the average size of the weights, and compare them, and you know that if the gradients are very high, the weight's very small, you need a small learning rate there. Because otherwise, you're going to change them dramatically at every step. And conversely, you can have the opposite. So you can make simple measurements on your network to see that things are pretty much well balanced everywhere. Now, there is something very important, the initialization. It looks stupid, huh? But the first question you have to ask is, why is it that we can optimize these crazy neural networks? Uh, if you just look at, uh, this is a non-convex, uh, smooth problem in one billion <coughs> dimensions, and ask uh, any reasonable optimization person, they're going to tell you you're crazy. And this is true. There are no, that's true. Really. Uh, Nonlinear, non-convex optimization in 10 dimensions is considered very challenging. So in 1 billion dimension? Come on, guys. <laughs> but the thing is that we're not really optimizing. We're just finding relatively good solutions, and we're trying to get the test set optimum, not the training set optimum. And the second one is that the problem is actually simpler than it looks. And um, you can wonder, what is the performance of a neural net? if you freeze the weights of the lower layers to random values. I suppose you choose them reasonably well. And there are two cases that are interesting. The first is the case of a two-layer network with threshold units. So I'm going to draw the thing again. So it's something where you have your input x, then you do a bunch of linear transformations, then you apply threshold units, and then you have a linear thing. And you're going to freeze this weight to some random values. Now, there is something that's been studied more recently in the case of large-scale linear learning, which is hashing. So one of the variants of hashing, and uh, I don't remember who actually wrote this particular variant, but it's quite interesting, is to do random projections. You take your points, compute a random projection, so you project a point along a random axis, and you do a thresholding at some median point, and that's one feature. And you do another random projection, another feature, another random projection, another feature. So if you have a very large dimensional space, you can show that even with a relatively small set of random projection, your linear classifier trend on the hash is going to work quite well. Now, this is similar to this. If I initialize random weights, I have a bunch of random projections and thresholding. And if I do my threshold right, it's the same thing. Now, if I do some gradient to try to optimize my random projections, I can only do better. But that tells you that the starting point is not that bad. So, of course, if you were using really random projections, you would need a much larger layer. You would need a lot more hidden units to get the same performance. But the, the message here is that, well, it's not that bad even with random weights. Now, there is a, that works only for one layer, though. Uh, there is another one that's very important, is the case of convolutional networks. So if you look in the papers about neural networks, you will see that deep convolutional neural networks are far easier to train than deep fully connected networks. Even though people start to find ways with subtle optimization to do it, uh, deep convolutional networks, we were able to train that in the 90s on our little uh, Palm Pilot equivalent computers. And, uh, well, if you had a deep, connected, completely connected network of the same depth, it was completely impossible. And the reason is about the same, and recently Stefan Mala did a lot of uh, work on what he called the scattering transform. 
and he said the basic ID, and uh, I'll, I'll just going to give the generic ID. The basic ID is that if you want to transform an image in a manner that's resistant to invariance, well, you could do Fourier transform, but Fourier transform wouldn't be resistant to small deformations, like elastic deformations. So if you want to be resistant to both, there are not so many things you can do. And he showed that one of the ways to do it robustly is to have a cascade of transformation, which are convolution uh, squaring, basically, taking absolute value, and repeating it after subsampling, like kind of a multi-level wavelet, it calls that a scattering transform. And that's very close to what there is in a convolutional network. So if you initialize a convolutional network that's large enough with random weights, well, it's going to work quite well. Now, you have to put a little caveat. If you take the OCR networks, well, the ones I've showed you yesterday had something like six uh, feature maps in the first layer. Well, if you take 50 and put everything random, there, it's going to work quite well. It's just much bigger. So what you gain by using gradients is make it smaller, more compact, faster, meaner. But, uh, uh, and uh, in practice, uh, the best result we can do by pre-computed scattering transforms is about uh, twice the error rate of the best neural nets on a variety of problems. But that tells you again that the initialization is not that bad if you do it right. So it's very important to get it right. So now we're going to study the simplest two-layer net we can think of. It has one input, x, as one weight, w1, going to one hyperbolic tangent, a second weight, w2, a second hyperbolic tangent, so y equal hyperbolic tangent of w2, hyperbolic tangent of w1, x. And I have two examples. One half as input, one half as desired output, and minus one half, minus one half, that I'm training with a mean squared loss. So here is the error in all its glory. And you know what? It's simple. There's two parameters. I can plot it. And here's the plot. Uh, uh, sorry for the colors again. But anyway, you see that if the hyperbolic tangents were linear, that would just W2 times W1. And I want W2 times W1 to be 1, basically, because it's identity that I want to train. So you can see that you have two hyperbolas that are close to the minimum. So what you get here is that you have two ravines, one like this and one like this, and you have two solutions here that represent essentially the, the, the minimum. And they're quite narrow. Maybe it's better to see one quarter like this. So let, let me uh, go back. And of course, if you chase the both W1 and W2 large, or both small, uh, well, you're going to, to have a high value, yeah. a high error, because uh, so if you look at this in terms of uh, level curves, you see these two ravines here. They're quite narrow, and you want to be here. So let's initialize things. I initialize randomly. What do you say about this? How is it going to work? Very good? Well, that's here. It's flat here. There is no gradient. I go nowhere. OK. Suppose I initialize here, clo very close to 0. Oh, it's flat here. Oh, yes. It's, uh, it's a second order flat surface. All the derivatives are 0, and even the second derivatives. That you're not in that one. If you had the more layers, the, the more layers you have, the more derivatives are 0. So you don't want to be here. Well, actually, if you just a little bit around here, it's going to work, but uh, because it's going to go to the right spot, and you're not going here, it's very high in, the, in this uh, upper corner. And uh, here you have another one of these ravines. Uh, if I initialize here, well, I'm going to be quite OK. So I have to be careful, because I'm going to oscillate that way, so I can go quite slowly. And eventually, I'm going to turn the, the, the but. but the reasonable thing to do is to initialize somewhere here. You, know, you, you set up the the variance of your weights to be in that zone here. And if you're here, well, you're going to jump here. If you're here, you're already good. If you're here, you're going to go down here. It's quite a reasonable thing to do. So, well, how can we generalize this and get a nice ideas about how to initialize your weights properly? And in fact, the, so this is my point, the main rule for random weight initialization is do not pick initial weights that kill the gradient. Otherwise, not lo it's loading unless your gradients are wrong, in which case it can, of course. <laughs> but uh, you're going to have other problems. Uh, so the real problem comes from the transfer function. Because if it was linear, 
I would have a quite simpler problem, it would be hyperbolic, it would be still ravines, but simpler. And if you look at the linear function, let's take... A, uh, so I, I, I say that we should have a look at the distribution of the inputs of the transfer function. We should have it in the linear part, because if it's in the linear part, my whole system is linear, it's much simpler. But it should be close enough to the non-linearity so that we have a chance to exploit it. And it's going to be quite different depending on what kind of nonlinear function you use. So let me give a few examples. I need my board again. Let's first take the case of the hyperbolic tangent. You know, in the past, uh, professors used to draw a perfect circle, and now we try to draw a perfect hyperbolic tangent, but <laughs> I'm still not good at that. So this is the activation, and this is the x, the, the output I'm going to have. And when you initialize the random weights, you would like your activation to be pretty much in that zone, because you're linear, and you're close enough to the nonlinearity so that when uh, the need will arise, the network will be able to engage the nonlinearities by growing a little bit the weights and start using the fact that it's nonlinear. So how do we do this? Well, let's suppose that you have inputs, let's say they're plus one or minus one. And then I have these W's here. And suppose they're random, you know, 50%, 50, 50, just for the sake of it. My activation is sum of wi xi, and I'm going to, I want this to be in that zone here. So how does it scale with the number of, uh, of uh, units here? So that's called the fan in, how many connections are coming in. Well, you have your weights, suppose they random mean zero and a certain standard deviation, or let's say random in a certain interval. And the plus one, minus one is going to change anything because plus one, minus one, the, you have the sign here, okay? So you have a sum of independent variables. So what you have here will have a standard deviation that goes like the square root of the number of units here. So the, the width of my thing is going to be zero mean, is going to be square root of n times something that's characteristic, let's say the, the standard deviation of how I initialize my weights. So if I want it to be in that zone, let's say between minus one and plus one, which is quite reasonable for hyperbolic tangent, I need to initialize my weights with uh, a standard deviation that's on the order of one over square root of n. And you can verify, you know, you, you don't have to do it blind. You, you do it, and then you look at the activation, run a couple examples, check it, and you check that it's correct. So when you do that again, you apply the nonlinearity and you have a new output. And because the hyperbolic tangent is going to be between minus one and plus one, but probably a little bit contracted. So it's going to be the same uh, down downstream. It's going to be inversely proportional to the square root of n. Make sense? Now you also know that the weights are going to have this kind of size. So what can you say about the, the learning rates, the eta? Well, if you have a very high fan in, the weights are should be small, because if they're large, you're in the flat part, you're not learning anything anyway. So the eta should be small, because, uh, well, otherwise, you're going to uh, make an update to the weights that's much larger than the weights themselves, and it's going to be crappy. So basically, the learning weights should follow about the same rules. But again, you can check. You, know, you can look at the size of the gradients and everything and check that it's correct. And when you do that right, I promise you, it goes a lot faster, assuming the gradients are correct. And I'm repeating that because if you program these things, you will discover that the gradients will be wrong. So, Okay, so now let's change a little bit. Let's take the normal sigmoid. So that was the hyperbolic tangent. The normal sigmoid is something like this. So that's one, zero. What's different? Anybody can tell me? 
And I want to be also in that zone between, let's say, minus 1 plus 1. And suppose again the inputs are minus 1 plus 1. So it's the same thing, square root of n. Except that now, at the next layer, the output will be always positive. So now the statistics on the next layer are, are changed. You have an output that's always positive. Uh, now the weights have different signs, but you have less standard deviation. You should boost them a little bit. And even you can check this by actually looking at the size of the activation and everything to make sure that you stay in the active part of all your transfer functions all over the place. Does it make sense? Yes, no? No? OK. Do it again. So I'm su here are my inputs. I say that plus one, minus one with 50% chances. I compute sum of wi xi. Now my wi, I assume I, I uh, take them randomly, mean zero, standard deviation s. So the xi plus one minus one doesn't change anything. So uh, I could just have this in terms of uh, statistics, it wouldn't change anything. And then I have my sigmoid like this. So if I initialize my weights on like s over square root of uh, n, where n is the fanin, I'm pretty much going to be in the active part of the sigmoid. But now look at the next layer. Now at the next layer, the xi, they're basically between 0 and 1. Random. Probably not uniform. Let's say they're 0 or 1. So there are two things I can do. One thing is I can bias them, so I can add an extra weight that comes to a 1, that put them back in, let's say, one minus half plus 1 half. And I'm back to the same situation, except with compressed space, so I need the bigger weights. Or I could leave them that, leave them that way, and when I have my weights here, I have to remember that uh, half of them will be killed because of the zero. Let's say, let's say that here you have half of the units at the next level are going to be zero, the other half are going to be one. So the division is no longer square root of n, it's square root of n over two. And you can go on. So that can be just figuring out analytically, it's complicated. What you can do is initialize with something reasonable and then you check that this is correct, that you initialize everything right. Now I would like to show a third kind of nonlinearity that's becoming fashionable is the, the, the one called ReLU. That's a rectified linear unit. Uh, that's a, uh, and you'll see why it's interesting and why it can be problematic. So ReLU is this. It's a max of 0 and x. The first thing is not really smooth. It doesn't really matter. You could make it smooth. That wouldn't change anything for our discussion. The second thing is, where do you want to initialize that one? Give me a, an interval somehow. Let's say this is 0, this is 1, this is minus 1. Give me an interval that's reasonable for the activation function of that thing. Hmm? Yeah, something like this, so maybe a little bit below zero so that you can actually use this and to any, actual, any value actually is scale independent. But let's say zero, one. And you see that the interval is biased. So when you do the, the, this, this usual thing, plus one, minus one, you need to have a bias unit, which is always one. So you initialize this, like the S over square root of n, so this first part of the activation is going to be between minus okay, uh, one half, between zero, minus, minus one half and plus one half. And then you need to bias it a little bit, you need to have a positive value here so that you move in that space here. So it's a little bit more complicated to initialize, in fact. Now, the interesting thing is that this is scale invariant. So suppose I have, um, suppose I have something like, say, a linear transform, then a, a ReLU, then a linear transform, then a ReLU, 
then a linear transform, then a ReLU, and work, uh, sorry, and continue like this. Uh, if I multiply these weights by two, uh, what's here, here, is roughly going to be multiplied by two as well. And so if I divide these weights by two, I'm back to the same thing. So basically, I can play with my weights and, and uh, multiply them by alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and so on, provided that the product of all these alphas is 1. And I'm not changing anything in the forward propagation. But I'm changing things in the backward path because I'm rescaling everything. So now we have this possibility to play, to try to adjust the geometry of the space by having a multiplicative factor everywhere. So one of the strategies that people who use the really uh, recommend, so that's Jeff Hinton and others, is to actually uh, bound the W. You say that when you do the update, you want W, let's say, in the first layer, W1 square, to be less than a certain constant. And you could do that for every unit, in fact. That wouldn't change that much. So that you maintain your thing in a, in a good zone. And you can play with these kind of things to try to remain in the good zone as long as possible. So you have this flexibility that's sort of nice, and this is well, why this kind of units is uh, interesting. But the price to pay is the initialization is more complex. There is very little way to do it uh, analytically. You basically have to guess and then adjust a little bit and, and check. So how are we doing so far? I just don't know how many other slides I have. You know? I want to check. 25 more minutes. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yes, I have plenty still. I'm fine. Um, what? Ah, uh, yes. OK. So optimization versus learning. I have 25 minutes, so I need to go faster. Uh, well, it's a learning problem. You know, you have this empirical cost, a big uh, sum, and can be large. And my examples are redundant. They're redundant because otherwise there is nothing to learn. So if you double the number of examples, you don't bring that much more information, a little bit more. And do we need to double the number of examples during the first iterations? That's a reason to be a bit careful. And also, sometimes the examples come on the fly. You know, they're not available simultaneously. They're on different machines, and you, well, you don't want to store them or retrieve them. So that tells you that maybe you, instead of doing a batch gradient descent, so here you have a regularization in addition. We can regularize a neural network. There's no problem. It's quite useful. You can do L1 regularization, L2 regularization. Everything works. So you can do the batch. Or instead, you can do the stochastic one, which at each step you pick just one example, and you adjust with the gradient with respect to that example only. So it's a very noisy process. So you're going to replace the actual gradient by a noisy estimate of the gradient computed on a single example. So how does it look like? Well, it looks like, like this. You have very noisy estimate of the gradients. The thing is moving everywhere. So it's harder to debug because you just have a lot of noise in the stuff. Uh, the GAN, so that was eta t, well, I call it gamma t this time, controls this. So basically, you have a kind of cloud of position. And the size of the cloud is controlled by the GAN. So you want to decrease the, the GAN to reduce the cloud and make it uh, uh, stay over the minimum as much as possible. And the question is, why is it attractive? Now, suppose that somebody made a mistake. They gave you a data set with 1,000 examples, but the mistake is that it's 10 times the same examples. You, know, you just have 10 copies of the same data set. Well, it's very... Well, it happens. You know, this, these things happen. So if you do a batch gradient descent, you're going to go over your 1,000 examples, compute a gradient, which is going to be mm, uh, 10 times the gradient uh, of the small set of examples. And you're going to have a curvature that's going to be higher, stronger gradient, stronger curvature. And uh, in the end, you're going to do 10 times the work for about the same information. And you go one step. Now, if you do something like a stochastic gradient, 
Well, after you've seen one of the examples, you make updates each time. Well, you've seen that information. Next time, you see it again. You see it again. You actually make more progress. You go roughly 10 times faster, at least. And this situation is very caricatural, 10 copies of the same examples. But think about something like digital recognition. Well, you have a lot of copies of almost the same examples. And this is what we want to do. We want to generalize. So this is very close to the notion of generalization, in a sense. So a practical illustration, and that was in a linear setup, but it's the same in a, in a network network. Uh, so this is um, which with accuracy you're going to optimize on the training set, on a log scale. And this is what the stochastic gradient does. It starts very quickly, but if you want a high accuracy in your optimization, it's an absolute catastrophe in training time. Now, if you take a superlinear algorithm like the LBFGS uh, batch and everything, you're going to have something like this. So this is a truncated Newton, which is another variant of this, this kind of algorithms. And because of the log scale here, you see it's, it's not a line. That means that uh, it's going to do more than exponential progress, meaning that the, the number of additional digits that you get in, your, uh, in, the, in the accurate error does more than increasing in a constant way. That's very fast. But practically, if you look at the testing cost, cost measure on the test set is going to go down at the beginning and then asymptote quite quickly. And the point that's important that asymptotes way before the, the fast algorithm overcomes the slow stochastic gradient. And you can actually prove that and make derivations about this kind of thing that this is happening before. So that means that if you're going to stop around here, which is a reasonable point to stop because you already have your close to your optimal testing cost, the stochastic gradient is going to be way faster than the smart algorithm. Now, you remember I told you that optimizing on the training set is not the same as optimizing for the testing error. Optim Suppose you want to go the fastest training error possible. Well, this algorithm is not good because you can do that. You can initialize with stochastic gradient, and when the slope is starting to become defavorable, you switch to the fast algorithm, and you go very fast on the training set. Now, question for you. When does this help the testing set performance? It's a good idea, because a lot of people suggest that. You know, start with stochastic gradient, and when it starts getting slow, switch to LBFGS and go on. Is it good for the testing set? Well, the answer is it depends, but it depends on what? Tell me. Oh, yes. Yes, but not, you, you think about, look about this curve, and maybe I should have put that one on top too. Now you have to look when the transition, the transition here is good. Well, it's difficult to measure in practice, but basically when the slope of this is being comparable to the slope here, you can switch, basically. So there is a point where you want to switch. And the question is, where is this point relative to this point, which is the moment where you are centered, essentially? So of course, if you want to do that, it's a complicated analysis to do. And uh, what you're going to find out is that it depends, again, on the eigenspectrum of the Hessian. And the thing that's happening is that these algorithms are second order. They're batch and second order. So they do a nice correction with the eigenspectrum of the Hessian in a way that's quite good. Well, SGD doesn't. So if the eigenspectrum of the Hessian is relatively favorable, and that was the case in this one that was LCV, uh, you have no benefit in doing these kind of things. Basically, when you switch to the fast algorithm, you're just overfitting. Uh, if the spectrum of the Hessian is not too favorable, that could be useful. But what I would like to say is that uh, uh, you have a lot of improved algorithms in the literature. And uh, recently, a lot of people try to do large-scale learning in neural nets, in back, plenty of things. And uh, you have techniques like uh, momentum and acceleration, mini-batch techniques, parallel training, and everything. And uh, the question to ask yourself when you read this paper is, do they quickly achieve good test error or good training error? And typically, when you read these papers, the experiment targets the test error, and the theory targets the training error. It's not the same. So that doesn't mean that the proposed method is useless at all. It could be very useful. It means that the theoretical argument they use is oversold. So you have to be a bit careful. You know, very often, and that's, um, 
an unfortunate thing in uh, machine learning. You have a lot of paper with a lot of theory, but the theory is off, meaning that it's a theoretical argument, but it's not on the right problem. And uh, people use... Uh, 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 it's not always the case. There are good papers, you know, just, but you'll see... <laughs> I mean, they're not even bad papers because sometimes the correct theory is so hard to do. But you have to be a little bit skeptical so what does it actually mean, that thing, that theorem, and is it really what I, I, I care about? Because there is, this, uh, uh, there is this fascination that people have with uh, uh, sophisticated mathematics in machine learning. And uh, for real mathematicians, they're not even that sophisticated. But, uh, but then when you look at them, you really have to ask whether this is vacuous or this is real. And depending on the papers and depending on the work and depending on how it's described, it could be vacuous or real. And sometimes the author is going to say, well, this is the best I could do, it's not perfect. And sometimes he's not going to say, he's going to say, this is a, a next year of accelerated method, everybody knows it's good, therefore it's good. And uh, that's, um, that's not the right argument that they should develop. So be very critical. And speaking of momentum and acceleration, so I'm going to describe two ideas, and they're a little bit oversold, but they can be useful. Okay? So the momentum is a technique for uh, batch gradient descent, but can be applied to stochastic just as well. And suppose you have a landscape you know, of uh, mountains and uh, hills and valleys and everything, and you do the gradient descent, you can diverge in the high curvature. This is a bit stupid, because if you take a ball and just release it, it's going to go down, but the ball has something else that uh, the gradient descent doesn't have, it has momentum, it has inertia. So the idea was Poliak in the 60s, I believe, say, I'm going to do inertia, I'm going to say that the, the speed at t plus 1 is the speed at times t plus some reduction factor, because I don't want to, uh, I want also to have friction to slow down the ball at the end, minus eta times the gradient, and then wt plus 1 is wt plus the speed. So you change the first order dynamic into a second order dynamic. So technically, you have wt, you have the previous search direction that you multiply by mu, let's say mu is something like 0.9, so you contract it a little bit, you add the gradient, and that's your new, search, your new direction, and you go on. And this has interesting properties. It works uh, well in certain cases, sometimes it's just too fast, it's difficult to adjust. Now, there is another idea that's Nesterov acceleration that's popular in the literature. It's not expressed like this. This is the expression of uh, Ilya Sutskever that uh, makes it more easy to understand. And I say, in fact, you're going to say vt plus 1 mu vt plus the gradient, not in w, but w plus mu vt, and then the update. So basically, this thing is that you're going to do this, but vt plus 1 is this sum. So first, you're adding 0.9 times the last search direction to go to a certain point, so you overshoot. Then you measure the gradient and you go back. It's a bit smarter because when you do this, uh, you take a gradient that's fresher, you know, the, because uh, the gradient here might not be very indicative of what's happening here. Things could be changed, especially when you come close to the end. And uh, Nesterov has this uh, wonderful paper that shows that if you play your cards right with mu in this kind of techniques, you can go, in many cases, uh, almost as fast as a second order method. So it's quite a nice algorithm. It's, it could be useful, but that's a training error. You know, you just, okay. Now, mini batches. A mini batch is to do stochastic gradient descent not by taking the gradient on a simple, like, single example, but you take, let's say, 1,000 examples, you compute the gradient of 1,000 examples, and you do one step that way. Uh, if you look at the theoretical analysis of stochastic gradient with mini batches, it's a wash because you take 1,000 times longer to compute the mini-batch, and you have 1,000 times square root, less noise, but that goes with, the, with about the same effect in the result. But uh, in fact, there are two events that make this useful. The first one is that the mini-batch are well suited to modern hardware. So you can compute faster, you have more flops. If you have a GPU, a mini-batch is a necessity, basically. The second one is that if you don't do gradient descent, but try to get second order information, when you get a mini-batch, 1,000 examples, you can already discover some of the beginning of the eigen spectrum, the Hessian, and correct for that. Well, if you have a single example, you can't. So I'm going to try to describe two little algorithms, but first, modern hardware, yes, that's true. I take my linear thing, x, w, y. Single exam formula, this is the one we saw many times. So this is a product of a matrix and a vector. So in blast term, it's called GEMV. 
product of a matrix and a vector is MV, an outer product of two vectors is a GER. Now suppose instead you have a matrix where each row is an example. You get all the outputs together by doing a matrix matrix product. Conversely, you have the gradient on Y, where each, uh, sorry, each, each colon is an example. Here each row is a gradient. You multiply it by the left, and you get again a matrix matrix. And if you do the sum of all these things, you get again a matrix matrix. And then the matrix matrix multiplication in something like BLAS is much, much faster than one you could do if you implement it with just matrix vector. And the reason is that you can decompose the matrix in blocks, and you do the matrix matrix products on little blocks that fit in the cache, and you push them together in such a way that you use the caching memory in optimal fashion. That's about 10 times faster. So even on the regular computer, even on that thing, doing matrix matrix can be 10 times faster than doing matrix vector when the things are large enough. Uh, if you start using multiple processors, you have matrix matrix optimization optimized for multiple processors on shared memory that are very good. And if you're on a GPU, it's even another, another order of magnitude. So, so far, there is nothing theoretical. It's just a change in the hardware. Uh, 15 years ago, it wasn't like that. Now, there is this example of, let's, I told you that when you have a mini batch, you can try to use the mini batch to uh, discover second order information and be a bit smarter about your optimization. And one of the simple techniques that's surprising, in my opinion, is to do successive LBFGS on mini batches. So at each step, you pick a set of random examples for mini batch number T, you initialize the net with the weights that you got before, and you do LBFGS, you optimize on your mini batch to obtain WT plus one. And a lot of people do this actually. And uh, the first time I saw it, I thought this is completely stupid. Because if you do this with convex models, well, you need the initialization, initialization doesn't matter. You find the optimum, the convex model, on the next mini batch, and on the next mini batch, and on the next mini batch. You have no, mem no memory of the past ones. So the only thing you're doing is that you're computing the minimum of successive mini batches, and the fact that you initialize doesn't change anything. Now, the surprising thing is that when you try this with multi-layer networks, it's not that bad. Actually, it could even be quite good. And the question is why? Any idea? Just to say something, you know, the, why this stuff works on neural network, sort of. Well, actually, it works. I say sort of because I'm pissed off that it works. Uh, it hurts my logic, but it does. And while it's relatively stupid, because if the model was con where if the models were convex, the only thing you would do would find the, op the successive optimum or successive mini batch without any memory of the past examples. Well, you have non-convexity, so you might find different local minima. Okay, let's say you have one of the reasons. Maybe when you initialize, you find better local minima and then you find the local minimum for that batch, but that takes you in something that's globally better for the next function. And then when you take the next mini batch, you go lower and everything. So that would be maybe a way to search the local minimum space, maybe. That's a reasonable, that's one of my hypotheses of why it works. Any other one? Well, I can give you the other one, maybe. The other one is that you don't do LBFGS to the end. You don't optimize completely. They, they, because they want to go fast, they stop a little bit early, so there might be a little memory of what's left of the WT inside. But it doesn't seem to me to be a very controlled situation. But it works, you know, just uh, I must recognize that it works in practice. There is another technique, which is the Hessian free training of James Martens. It's quite complicated. Uh, okay, let me try to simplify it. Uh, the thing is that uh, you want to estimate uh, a form of the Hessian, actually a, a, a compact version of the Hessian, and this case is a truncated Newton business or whatever, and you want to estimate it on the fly. The problem is that when you change mini batch, you change Hessian, and all these methods of estimating the Hessian, you know, uh, I showed you that you, you keep uh, successive equations that reveal something about the Hessian, but if these successive equations come from different mini batches, they reveal things about Hessians that could be quite different, it's messy. 
So in my opinion, what makes uh, James Martin's method work is this, that he first picks a mini batch, the mini batch zero, and every time he's doing the second order estimation of the Hessian, it's always on the first mini batch zero. So he uses the first mini batch, and that's the only one he's going to use to find the curvature. But he takes the gradient from successive mini batches. So he estimates the curvature progressively on the first mini batch, which is enough to give at least the beginning of the first eigen spectrum, the, the first eigen values. And then he uses that information to correct the gradients on each of the mini batches. Okay, it looks a little bit messy, but it works too. And I would say that uh, uh, I would like to see nicer methods, things that I understand better, things that are more elegant, but these things work. These things work. And finally, there's a parallel training for neural nets. It's an active topic of research. You know, there are more, lots of big companies are making a big fuss about large neural nets that are bigger than the machine and everything. I don't know if we actually need that because, uh, as I told you, um, I think a machine is powerful enough to do a lot of things, but, and there is no clear winner yet. But there is one algorithm that one should always consider as a baseline. It's the log-free stochastic gradient. You do stochastic gradient of plenty of processors on a shared memory. You put weight in a shared memory. In theory, every time you access the weight or update the weights, you would want to do it by locking the weights so that nobody access them. You update them you unlock them and so on, so that every uh, processor has a consistent view of the weight. Well, forget about this, just write, and no problem if there is a, a locking or concurrency issue. And it's just a little bit more noise in the stochastic gradient process. And there are some uh, analyses of this that are quite difficult to do, but the thing is, in practice, this works very well, even if the shared memory is actually a distributed shared memory of plenty of processors. Yes? What you describe is pretty much a shared memory on a network fabric. Yeah, without absolutely any lock. And the thing works surprisingly well. Now it's a bit uh, itchy, you know, it's, okay. But it's, it's an interesting baseline, and this baseline can give a, a very hard time to fancy sophisticated parallel algorithms. So it's good to know that even something stupid like this works. And one of the reasons is that um, it was a long time ago, we tried neural nets with plenty of crappy things, like trying to discretize the weights on six bits to run them on, on, on particular hardware works. Try to change nonlinear function and discretize it as a, with, with just powers of two, just a model, uh, instead of computing the exact hyperbolic tangent, just compute the exponent. And Le, Le Mantissa, forget about it, works. So these things are very resistant to noise. So this kind of noise is not a big problem. And I think that's uh, all I want to say for this hour. Questions? Uh, I had a small question about uh, when you were talking about the random initialization part. Y yes. Uh, can we sort of say that the moral of this result is that if you're doing random stuff, it's really hard to lose mem uh, to lose information because it's really unlikely that like the directions of your projection are like aligned with the directions where the information actually is carried so like most of the time you're not losing information uh, well um, uh, your question is theoretical in nature so I'd have to look at theoretical work to answer so the answer probably I'm going to look at the hashing argument which is one of the things I discussed uh, the hashing, uh, random projection and thresholding, hashing by random projection and thresholding, doesn't lose that much information, meaning that uh, you're going to recover quite quickly the important information after a reasonable number of random projections. That's the kind of result, so it's close to what you say. Uh, I suggest, if you want to know this precisely, you must investigate this kind of hashing results. And there are lots of them. They not always apply uh, that simply, but okay. Yes? So as you motivated, uh, this is a very highly non-convex uh, surface, and yes. we are obviously finding some kind of local minima. Yes. Is there been any understanding of what, how good these local minima are? I mean, you presented a ton of different methods. Are we at like 10% of what we potentially could be? Like 20%? Like, are we close to the global minima? Okay. 
several observations. First, do you want to find the global minimum? It could be an awful overfit. If you look at convolutional net, uh, if you check a convolutional network, for instance, as soon as you have enough layers and it's, they start working, you add more layers, they don't really overfit. They become a bit unstable, but they don't overfit because you can't optimize that much, essentially. The second one is um, what do you understand about the local minima? So the arguments I gave here is that, you know, the thing is that it's not as bad as it looks because even if you initialize randomly correctly, it's not that bad a starting point in general. So that means that the landscape is quite regular. For instance, you take a fully connected network with one hidden layer, well, you can permute all the hidden units. So you have, a, if you have an edge hidden unit, a factorial edge replication of the same space. So you don't have one global minimum, you are at least a factorial edge ones. Uh, and so you have to find something that's close enough. Uh, so, so it's actually not that bad. Uh, another argument is um, uh, this was a result by Martin Van Wright, and he tried to the motivation, the experimental, experimental motivation was to use a non-convex loss, like a um, non-convex loss function could be interesting, especially when you have asymmetric classification, and uh, run experiments to see uh, how many different uh, training uh, set errors you get. And of course, when you change the initialization, you get a range of different training set errors. Now, the observation was the test set error is almost about the same. So then uh, Martin has a theoretical analysis that relies on some assumptions that you don't know if you can really make them. But the basic uh, idea is that a lot of the variations between local minima are actually less important than the difference between training and test. So in the space between training error and testing error, it's large enough that you can replace a sophisticated optimization by something as brutal as SGD. It's also large enough that a number of local minima issues are not going to be that important. So that's another viewpoint on the thing. But other than that, it's still mysterious. You know, when in perceptrons they say you have to solve the credit assignment problem, it's impossible. Uh, my comment was it's, it's easier than we thought, but it's still a bit uh, strange. We haven't understood that completely yet. Any more questions from the observation launch? No, there are no questions from here, thanks. Okay. I have also a question now. Okay, now we all want to try neural networks on our problem. So what toolbox should we use? Should we use Lush or Torch or...? Uh, Lush is... Uh, I wouldn't recommend it because it's really esoteric and complex. I, I, I would recommend the Torch thing. Torch is good. And uh, Benjo, Joshua Benjo also has the Theano thing that's Python, so people like Python. Uh, I like it less than Torch because it's less uh, pure in, in this, and it's also developed over more years, so it's more... Uh, complex. Uh, the benefit of Torch, which is developed by Ronald Colobert, is that Ronald is a very... When he doesn't like something, he just undoes it, he erases it, and redo it from scratch. So the, the thing is pretty clean and neat and small. On the other hand, uh, you have to be aware that uh, maybe Ronald is going to rewrite what you're using in a way that's different. Mm -hmm. But that's no problem. You know, it's open. You can keep your own version. It's fine. It's and better to understand. And these toolbox, do they do these initialization tricks automatically and the scaling tricks and the pooling and everything? Or they how much thinking is in, uh, uh, needed to uh, apply them? The initialization trick, there are distant initializations in something like Torch. Mm -hmm. And the pooling, the, the contrast normalization, it's all there. The ReLU is not there, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, you have to understand what you do. Just don't rely on the toolbox. Really, you have to understand what you're doing. Mm -hmm. you look at the code. The, 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 a good reason to use Torch is the code is super small. Mm -hmm. So you can actually look and, and see what it does and understand it. Because eh, you, know, you shouldn't trust like that. Huh? Mm -hmm. 